Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who works the Corona hotline almost as good as Tony Romo. He is the captain. And a man that has no FOMO. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are drinking Indica by the Lost Coast Brewery in Eureka, California, garage grade three and a half bottle caps out of five. Indica India Pale Ale is a smooth, full-bodied, unfiltered beer with an intense spiritual aroma. And this week's beer was brought to us by our good friends right here. First up, we have Christina in Duluth, Minnesota. And a big shout to Lisa in Seattle, and I guess uh, John and RT there real pieces of shit but you don't even know these people yes but they didn't donate to the beer fund so they're real pieces of shit and lisa seems to think so anyway uh, a big thank you to elizabeth in austin texas and a big we like your jib to karen in naperville illinois next up we have seth and seth i'm gonna give this a shot and i apologize to all the good people living in this this wonderful city <laughs> oh god Seth in Frewsburg. Old Frewsburg. Frewsburg, New York. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Becca B. in Eagleville, Pennsylvania. Oh, sorry. Jumped ahead. And Laura in Newark, Delaware. Thank you to all for filling up the fridge for this week's show. If you want to help us out with next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And don't forget to check us out on the Stitcher app. It's free. That's where you get all of our old episodes and for our wonderful show that everybody's talking about. Everyone. Everybody. I've I've seen it on Fox News, on CNN, CNN, on on MSNBC, on the Good Morning America. Is that even Good Morning something show? The president (laughs) even said the show is bigly. It's bigly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Check out our other show, Off Uh, the Record. It's available only on Stitcher Premium. All right. Gather around. Grab a chair. Grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. On Thanksgiving Day, November 24th, 2016, Keith Papini says he got up early that day and at 4.30 a.m. his cell phone rang. Now, this call comes in and he says it's a number he did not recognize. So he didn't answer his phone. It's an unknown caller. Yeah. Then the home phone is ringing to which he does answer the home phone. And he told 2020 that it was his wife screaming in the background, yelling his name and a police officer to which he could hear the officer telling the wife that she needed to be calm. She needed to calm down. Mm -hmm. 22 days after she vanished, Sherry Papini turned up 150 miles away from her home. She was found in Yolo County around 4 a.m. on the side of an entrance ramp to the northbound I-5 highway. This is near County Road 17. A female motorist, Allison Sutton, called police upon seeing a frantic woman roadside waving what she believed to be a shirt. Now, Allison says she didn't stop because she wasn't certain that this whole situation was safe for her to stop. Right. She thought it was just maybe a crazy person on the side of the road. A second driver, this was a truck driver, he he did stop, and he called police. Now, Sherry Papini was found. She was clothed in light gray sweatpants and a dark gray sweatshirt. I point out what she was found in because this is not what she was wearing when she went missing. There was also a chain wrapped around her waist and her left wrist was tethered to the chain with a zip tie. According to the local papers, specifically the Sacramento Bee and the Reading Record Searchlight, Sherry also had hose clamps around her ankles to which Sergeant Brian Jackson said, quote, appeared to have acted as pain compliance restraints. It's very important to understand that nearly everything we know about Sherry's ordeal and her release, we know from her husband, Keith. Mm -hmm. Sherry has never made a public statement. 
She has never, well, she's not even appeared in public at all about this. And the sheriff's office, the Shasta County Sheriff's Office, they've only really addressed any of these circumstances regarding Sherry's ordeal, possibly because they feel that they've been forced to because of Keith's public statements. Mm -hmm. We'll present what he says, what Keith says, and then we'll address what, if anything, we actually know to be true. So I'm going to paraphrase some of this stuff uh, that follows. But this is what Keith told 2020 about Sherry's release. He says that she was bound, that she had a chain around her waist, she had a bag over her head, He says he can't remember if it was her right or her left arm that was chained to the chain, but one of her arms was chained to the chain and then the other hand was chained to something inside the vehicle. And to be clear, the interviewer wants to clarify and says, this is to make sure that she didn't jump out of the vehicle to which he says, yes. Now he says at some point they, cut something to free her restraint that was holding her to the vehicle. Then they pushed her out and they drove away. Sherry had one hand free and took the bag off of her head. And at this point, she has no idea where she is. She runs to a house to which she doesn't say, she says to him that it didn't look to be like a good idea. Mm -hmm. So she then ran to another building, but couldn't get inside the building. And that's when she chose to run to the freeway. And how far away is she found from her actual home? 150 miles. So quite a distance. Yeah. And he goes on to tell 2020 that she's, you know, she's screaming, she's coughing. Um, He says that she's coughing up blood and screaming, trying to get people to stop, you know, get a vehicle to stop so they can help her. Mm -hmm. But she tells him that she thinks that because of the chains, the chain wrapped around her, that maybe people thought she escaped from a prison or, or escaped from somewhere that, you know, that she was a bad person and maybe that's why they wouldn't stop. So she purposely tried to hide the chain to try to get somebody to stop. And eventually we know that somebody did stop. Well, and I guess she was severely beaten as well. I mean, she had a broken nose and she had bumps. that seemed like all over her face. So that this could be an, you know, I, I don't know if there was any dried blood or what the bruising situation would be, but that, that could startle somebody. The 2020 broadcast, they played a radio transmission that, that summoned the ambulance to the scene where Sherry was found. You can hear like radio chatter, but what, what I heard in there says attention station eight unknown medical problem. It's going to be North on I five female needs medical attention. She is heavily battered. It's going to be some sort of an assault. Now, Keith, after the phone call, he rushes to the Woodland Memorial hospital. This to see his wife, Sherry. He says when he got to Sherry's room, he was horrified. He told Good Morning America, quote, nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to see upon my arrival at the hospital, nor the details of the true hell I was about to hear. My first sight of my wife in a hospital bed, her face covered in bruises ranging from yellow to black because of repeated beatings, the bridge of her nose broken. Her now emaciated body of 87 pounds was covered in multicolored bruises, severe burns, red rashes, and chain markings. Her signature long blonde hair had been chopped off. She had been branded, and I could feel the rise of her scabs under my fingers, end quote. The Shasta County Sheriff's Office, well, their information has been much less detailed than that of her husband. And authorities actually expressed frustration that Keith revealed so much information to the media. Right, because this is an ongoing investigation. So he says that her injuries, the way he describes it, this is pretty severe stuff, right? Yeah. The the thing that would kind of go against that 
is this regarding the severity of her injuries. Sherry Papini was released from the hospital and went to a hotel with her husband that same day. Right. And this, according to the sheriff, she was treated for her injuries and released just as someone would be if they had sprained an ankle. That's what the sheriff said. Yeah. But but the sheriff did say that they were, were ecstatic to report that Sherry did, that she was located and had been reunited with her family. Right. But to to be on the side uh, of Keith and his wife, look at some of these brutal UFC fights. People go five rounds, 25 minutes of punching each other in the face and, kicking each other in the shins and these guys barely can walk out of the octagon. Their faces look deformed. They look awful during the press conferences. They go get checked out by the doctor and then they're, they're sent away. The investigators from the major crimes unit did speak with Sherry. This was briefly in the hospital. And then they did question her at length five days later after she recovered from these injuries. Now, according to Sheriff Paseco, Sherry was, quote, cooperative and courageous in the intense and traumatic interviews with investigators. He said Sherry reported the following. She said she was abducted by two Hispanic women in a dark colored SUV with large rear windows. She had no other description of the vehicle, and she could not identify it on any video surveillance footage taken in the area around the time of her abduction. Note that the sheriff's office never came out and said that Sherry was definitely abducted while on her run. We know that to be Mm -hmm. believed to be the case by her family beforehand. All right. So what else have we learned? Sherry only gives the officers a, let's say, vague description of her abductors, right? Mm -hmm. And she went on to tell police that she avoided looking at them so they would not beat her and that her head was covered for some of the time that she was held captive. And we don't know how dark it was in this place or anything. Yeah, yeah. There, again, we have vague descriptions of everything because we're hearing this. This is what Sherry tells the police, and this is what they have chose to release to the public. She says that one of the women, no, she says that she was abducted by two women. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the women had a long curly hair, thin eyebrows, and pierced ears. She had a thick accent, and she appeared to be between 20 and 30 years old, about 5 foot, 5 inches tall. Suspect number two, according to Sherry, was older, maybe 40 to 50 years of age, about 5 foot 7, and had straight black hair with some gray. She had thick eyebrows and pierced ears, Both were armed with handguns. She said that the kidnappers drove for about two and a half hours nonstop on the first day. The kidnappers spoke Spanish most of the time. The female captors were the only two people with whom Sherry had contact with for the duration of her captivity. Basenko confirmed that she was bound with restraints when she was found. And Jackson, the other officer, said that Sherry had been branded on her right shoulder after and appeared battered and bruised. Now they, they actually think this branding was something, like it actually said something. Yeah, the description I read was that the brand appeared to be a message rather than a symbol. Mm. But whatever it is, it's They're, unclear what, it, what it's intended to be. Like well, I think they know what it is, or at least the... the the rumors that I heard is they know what the message is. They're just not releasing that to the public. Okay. I, I had saw that it was illegible that okay. they, they couldn't make anything out of it, but I don't know that to be true. So I don't want to, I don't want to steer anybody the wrong way. The Either captain. way. I mean, that's pretty creepy that somebody would brand you and not just brand you with some symbol, but some type of message. Sherry told investigators that she was not sexually assaulted. Uh, We do have investigators that that did confirm that Sherry's hair was shoulder length when Mm -hmm. she was found. Now, I do want to point out that a lot of people suspect that Sherry's exceedingly long hair was actually extensions that were may have just been removed. 
Mm-hmm. The, the thing here to give the best description to those out there listening is that when she was found, her hair was not what I would call short. It was just shorter. It was, it was shorter length at the time. Now, Sherry told detectives that just before she was released, she could hear her captors having an argument followed by a gunshot. She said the younger of her abductors then took her from the room where she was being held captive, drove her down a winding road, and dropped her off near Interstate 5. A be on the lookout immediately went out for a dark-colored SUV with two Latino women, but everyone acknowledged that in California that description, well, it didn't go very far. Mm -hmm. On the day after Sherry was found, her sister held a press conference, and she was reading a statement that was prepared by Sherry and Keith. The gist of it really is just giving thanks to all the people that helped search for her and just being thankful that she was returned and allowed to go home in time for Thanksgiving. Now, following this statement, Sheila agreed to answer some questions. But where this whole thing gets tricky again, Sheila seems to have very little information. She didn't know whether Sherry had seen her kids yet. This is the day after she was found. She didn't know whether a ransom was paid. She didn't seem to have any interest in discussing who might have done this to her sister. She didn't even have an answer to a reporter's question as to whether Sherry was employed or not at the time of the abduction. Really, she just kept repeating that the two had a joyous reunion. It, it For anybody that saw this, well, for me anyway, Captain, it was just kind of a strange press conference. And it probably, to keep things cleaner, it might have been a whole lot better if, if she would have just not opened it up to questions at all. Right, gave the statement and, and walked away. Right, because uh, her not having, having the answers to some very simple questions, it really didn't help the public opinion. Now, keep in mind, at this time, even when she was missing, there were people out there that were suspicious of this quote unquote abduction. That was it a voluntary situation, right? Was, was this a, a, a cry for help? Was this seeking was it a attention? Hoax. Yeah. And then when she's found and claims to have been released, mm-hmm. those people that were suspicious before, they're even more suspicious now. Phony because, baloney. Right. Yeah. Because of very sparse details provided, the tide of public opinion began to shift. Sheriff Basenko said his department continued to follow investigative leads and warned people that, quote, until we identify the suspect, the public should remain cautious, end quote. But contradictorily, also said that, quote, details of this investigation point to this being an isolated incident, end quote. Mm. Yeah. That's... That's a weird statement. Yeah, he said that police still did not know the motive for the abduction or whether Sherry was a specific target or this was a random abduction. He also Mm. said that because the case was still active, some sensitive details were being withheld, and he expressed concern that some of the information provided by Keith could affect the integrity of the investigation. Mm -hmm. I... (laughs) I really want to know those sensitive, those sensitive details. Yeah. So what I'm getting at though, is it can't be, it can't be both, right? If you're saying that this is an isolated incident, Mm -hmm. but the public should remain cautious. It's just, it's very confusing. These statements coming out from the sheriff's department. Now you don't know when you, when you review this, you look at it at it and you'll wonder, okay, is this, Sheriff's department just really in need of a PR person Mm -hmm. or, or are they confused themselves about the whole investigation about, about what could have took place? Well, it kind of stinks. Tom (laughs) Bastinko. Well, the, the sheriff said, despite over 600 tips quote, none of the received tips have been able to generate a viable lead or information as to who is responsible for Sherry's abduction. 
Sure enough, due to lack of information, rumors and gossip really took over in this case. People began to theorize that perhaps there was more to the story. The theory that that Sherry and perhaps Keith together fabricated the whole thing. This really started to gain some traction. And an article ran in the Huffington Post on December 2nd, 2016. They reported the following, that, that the Huff Post had spoke to a communications officer or asked to speak with the communications officer at the sheriff's office. They were connected to a woman named Kelly, to which no last name was given. The Huff Post asked Kelly if authorities suspected some kind of hoax in this case. Kelly stated, I don't know if the words ruled out can be used. Then on December 6, George Stepanopoulos asked Sheriff Basenko whether he had any reason to doubt Sherry's story. Yeah. Basenko responded, absolutely none. So far, we are still investigating this as a kidnapping abduction and everything that she has provided us thus far is indicating that. Basenko backtracked a bit in an interview with people using a double negative saying authorities have no reason not to believe Sherry, but he also said abductions are rare in themselves, especially adult abductions on top of this being two women who Sherry described as her captors is even more unique. Mm -hmm. So there remains a number of concerns that we have, meaning we the sheriff's office allow me to be a bit of a pest a buzzing gnat i want to tell you about james patterson's thriller killer instinct the book really does get under your skin that's what good page turners do it even inspired the tv series instinct but the novel is 10 times better. That's why you've got to read James Patterson's Killer Instinct. Available wherever books are sold. Remember, you heard the buzz here first. On average, a burglary happens once every 23 seconds in the U.S. But only one in five homes have home security, probably because most companies don't make it easy. It's confusing. It's expensive. It takes too much time. It can be a hassle but not with Simply Safe. Simply Safe makes it easy on you with no contract, hidden fees, or fine print. Simply Safe protects every door, window, and room with 24/7 professional monitoring for just $15 a month. It's won a ton of awards from CNET to New York Times wire cutter. One thing that truly makes Simply Safe stand out is their video verification technology. They can visually confirm that the break-in is happening, allowing police to get to the scene 3.5 times faster. And here's what I absolutely love about Simply Safe: It is 100% whole home protection. Protection against intruders, fires, water damage, medical emergencies, and more. All monitored 24-7 by professionals. Visit simplysafe.com slash garage and you'll get free shipping and a 60-day risk-free trial. You got nothing to lose. Go now and be sure you go to simplysafe.com slash garage so they know our show sent you. That's simplysafe.com slash garage. That's simplysafe.com slash garage. Read as much as you want from the over 1 million books available on Kindle Unlimited. Kindle puts over 1 million ebooks and 5,000 audiobooks right at your fingertips so you can easily switch from reading to listening when your eyes need a break. You can also choose from a rotating selection of current issues from popular magazines. Books may be added and removed from time to time, but with a variety of genres and titles to choose from, you can enjoy popular titles or discover your new favorite series. Like A Killer's Mine, River in Darkness, and The Handmaid's Tale. And this week's recommended reading, Killer Instinct by James Patterson. Read anywhere, on the bus, on your break, in your bed, on whatever device you prefer like your phone, tablet, PC, or e-reader. When you're reading a book, the Kindle app will automatically sync where you left off, along with any bookmarks, highlights, or notes. You can start reading on one device and pick up on another. For a limited time, get three months of Kindle Unlimited for just $1.99. 
by visiting amazon.com slash TCG. Make sure you type it all in lowercase. That's amazon.com slash TCG for three months of Kindle Unlimited for just $1.99. Check out amazon.com slash TCG today. All right, welcome back to the garage. I cleaned it for you. I, I never hope left. You enjoy. Yeah, I never left. And again, another happy birthday to the Colonel. So some people are calling this whole abduction a hoax, right, Captain? Yeah. So I thought let's take some time here and sort through some of the things that people point to, some of the theories, uh, if you will. Mm -hmm. Okay. For one thing, and this stems from a 2003 blog post that turned up on a defunct website called Skinheads. That's uh, with a Z. This was essentially a, well, a racist blog, right? Yeah. Hence the name, right? Yeah. Uh, and it sounds racist. Right. And in 2003, yeah, it's not about haircuts. Mm -hmm. It's it's about uh, being a racist. Right. So the 2003 post was written by Sherry Graff. And I think I have that right. Actually, right. I think I have that wrong. It, but I'm going to spell it for you. Sherry, G-R-A-E-F-F. -F. From Shasta Lake. Right, that's Sherry's uh, maiden name. Correct. And I believe that's her hometown. Mm -hmm. The Post rallied against Latinos, who the author said hated her because she was, quote, drug-free, white, and proud of her blood and heritage. Mm -hmm. The blog post recounted a story of a violent altercation with a Latino girl now, Sherry's ex-husband, who we referenced earlier, says that Sherry did not write this post. And he says that Sherry wasn't racist when he knew her. Right. Sheriff Basanko said, quote, we are familiar with that blog. We do not know if it has any relevance to this case or not, end quote. Sherry and Keith, of course, made no direct comment on the blog post. Although Keith seemed to touch on it in his Good Morning America interview saying, quote, I understand people want proof that this was not some sort of hoax or plan to gain money or some fabricated race war. I do not see a purpose in addressing each preposterous lie, end quote. Sherry also maintained a public Pinterest account that contained a section marked cultural differences featuring memes expressing concerns about illegal immigrants and Muslims. This section has since been taken down. There is well, plenty to point that's to strange. Yeah. There is plenty to point to that Sherry did write the blog post. As you pointed out, it's her maiden name. It's her hometown. I there, guess there was also a rumor that, uh, that somebody thought maybe, um, one of her friends wrote it to basically smear her. Um, I, did you hear that anywhere? Well, I, I heard that plus other reasons why people suspect that it was not her or the theories on who could have posted that pretending to be her. And it appears to me what information that would indicate that it was her that wrote it is all information that anybody that knew her could have known. They would have right. known all that stuff. You know, people people point to a, a point in the post where where it references her family's pizza restaurant, which her family, I guess her parents do own or did own a pizza restaurant at one point. Well, but look, whether it was her, whether it was fake, whatever, the fact of the matter is there's evidence that it was there. And so if that would have ticked off a, a gang or ticked off anybody and they said we want to go after this individual they would be going after her they they wouldn't have any knowledge uh, that she didn't write it well right and i don't know i think it's it's all weird that, that we have that post and then later she's saying she was abducted by two hispanic women 
or Hispanic looking women. And, but, but the other thing too, that, that I find odd is we're talking about, it's what, like 13 years apart. Yeah. Yeah. 15. Uh, yeah. 12, 13 years later. That seems. Yeah. It would say, it seems strange that somebody would find a post from 13 years ago and then track the person down and then kidnap them. So digging into Sherry's past revealed something else. In a 2003 Shasta County Sheriff's Office incident report, which is only two sentences long, it stated that Sherry's mother, Loretta, called the Sheriff's Office to ask for help with her daughter, Sherry, who had been harming herself and blaming her injuries on her mother. This call by Loretta to the Sheriff's Office about Sherry was one of several made by Sherry's family about her, this is during the years between 2000 and 2003. In 2000, her father, Richard, alleged his daughter burglarized his residence. Three years later, he alleged she made unauthorized withdrawals from his checking account. And in 2000, Sherry's sister, Sheila, alleged her back door had been kicked in and she believed Sherry did it. The reports provide no details about an arrest and it is unknown whether Sherry was ever charged with a crime, any type of crime resulting from right. these these but this, reports. Like you said, it was several years before. Again, yes. Yeah. We're talking 13 to 16 years beforehand. Yeah. And everybody goes through phases. <laughs> Right. I mean, I mean, the- I, look, I'm laughing, but I'm only laughing because I'm vi- I'm visualizing somebody kicking in their sister's door. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we we go through phases, but I don't. <laughs> hey, th- fuck your couch. Yeah, I don't you know. know that I've ever I've never kicked in anybody's door. Um, now, I, b- I bet you <laughs> I bet you, you, have. you bet you bet that I have. Huh? I bet you've tried. I'm not saying that you succeeded. Well, listen to this. This, this I think, is, is more interesting. The, the sheriff's office, this is in response to a FOIA request made by the Sacramento Bee, the newspaper. This provided expense reports for out-of-state travel in related to this case. Based on these receipts, two detectives traveled cross-country to Detroit, Michigan, and its suburbs of New Hudson, Northville, Plymouth, in Canton between November 9th and November 11th, 2016, the same mm. year that she was abducted. Yeah. This is this is actually while she's still missing. So Sheriff Basenko declined to spe- to specify why the detectives went to Michigan or what they found, if anything, there. Right. But about a year after Sherry was returned, the sheriff's office confirmed in an official pl- press release that Sherry and a male acquaintance from Michigan, that's what they were calling him, were involved in an online texting relationship. Now, Sergeant Jackson would not specify whether the relationship was a romantic one, but he did confirm that the text messages went back several months. He also stated that the male acquaintance visited California in the days before Sherry went missing. A press release later clarified Quote, days prior to Sherry's disappearance, Sherry and the male acquaintance text each other in an attempt to meet while he was in California. This is according to Sergeant Jackson. Right. According to him, that is why they went to Michigan. And he said ruled out. Went went back to Michigan and ruled out. Right. That the acquaintance was involved. Well, I, I think this just shows you that... Uh you know, the, the, the thought process of their marriage being so great and so romantic and, and so pic- picture perfect that it just is not true. Yeah. And it seems, it seems like most people believe that Keith knew nothing about this relationship, regardless of what kind of relationship it, it was. Oh, well, isn't the thought process that, um, she was texting this guy and the, one of the reasons why I don't think Keith knew about it was that the guy's name was saved as a female's name. Yeah, and I saw some... I mean, that's shady. Well, I saw some information out there too that would suggest that... 
You shady girl. This man being saved under a fake woman's name and her contacts may not have been a one-time situation. That this might have happened before, right. where where other men were saved under female names. How about this theory? The theory that the well, remember the GoFundMe campaign. Mm-hmm. the The purpose of the GoFundMe campaign, which was started by Keith's sister Suzanne on his behalf was to raise money to quote, bring Sherry home safe well, for like private investigators and stuff like that too. All funds were to go directly to the family. The GoFundMe raised $49,070. Their goal was $50,000 mm. and it raised this amount of money fairly quickly. No one s- seems to be certain what the funds were actually used for. Sherry and all of her family members, including the ones who were in the public faces of her search, have completely withdrawn from the public regarding this. And the money has not been returned. We know Sherry came home, but we don't know where that money went. Yeah, and Keith has never made a statement on where that money went. The other thing that's weird about it, too, is that you're using this resource and you're, you're updating people to get money. Then you get a bunch of money, and then when she's found, you don't even update these people. Mm -hmm. And these, some of these people, because they saw your story in People Magazine or on the Today Show or however they saw your story, there's people from all over the country uh, that were were donating money to to help find your wife, and and you didn't even put an update uh, on the page. Right now, almost a year after Sherry vanished. The sheriff's office issued a very interesting press release, a document entitled Kidnapping Investigation Update, stated that Sherry had both male and female DNA on her when she was found. The samples were uploaded into CODIS DNA database on, well, it looks like April or May of 2017, but so far there's never been any matches to any known offenders. The DNA from Sherry's husband, Keith, was not among the two profiles. They tested it against Keith. The male DNA was compiled from the clothing Sherry was found, uh, was wearing when she was found. Look, she alleged that, that she had two female abductors. She alleged that they gave her the clothing to wear. So it is possible. This doesn't have to mean that a male was involved in her abduction or in whatever's going on here. It is possible that that DNA was already on the clothing when it was given to her to wear. Right. But they released more information, right? Yeah. The the sheriff's office revealed that Sherry told investigators that during her abduction, she got into an altercation with the younger abductor. Mm -hmm. And this took place in a bathroom when, so Sherry, according to the story, she's allowed to take a shower. And at some point they get into this altercation Sherry says that she slammed the captor's head into the toilet in the bathroom before she was subdued and then returned to her room where she was being held. She reported that she cut the side of her foot during this confrontation. People have pointed out that there were photos of Sherry and that they, they were being reviewed by the police department, by the sheriff's office. And there doesn't seem to be any evidence in those photos that they can see that there were cuts on her foot or either foot to back up this, this whole story. Right. But you, you, (laughs) it makes you question when did this, uh, this happen during her captive time, 22 days Did it happen at the beginning. Uh, was it not that bad? Was she just mistaken? Was she drugged at any point? Uh, during during this capture? Who knows? Well, what we do know is that they're saying that she is providing very little details because she can't recall them. Right. That, it, that she's just not able to provide complete information to the sheriff's office. And we'll get back to this October 2017 press release in, in just a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do want to point this point out this while we're going through these suspicions and different theories, right? 
So we talked about the neighbors. Well, there's more information there too. So the neighbors who lived near the Papinis said that Sherry wasn't a runner, according to their knowledge. Right. Now, neighbor Joyce Allison said, quote, I've been here 12 years and I've never seen her jogging. Betty Vaughn, whose home overlooked the spot where Sherry's phone was located, said, quote, I've never seen her jogging, never seen her coming to the mailboxes. Of course, a couple of neighbors told police that they thought they saw Sherry on the day she disappeared, one at nine, right. one around 11, although it's not clear if she was actually running, according to those eyewitness reports. Yeah, look, these neighbors could just be strange individuals. Yeah, so for those that we keep referencing these mailboxes, I think we probably should have done a better job of describing that. Speak for yourself. <laughs> well, yeah, the, since it's a such a rural area, they actually have a unit like of a mail- bank of mailboxes. Yeah. All everybody that lives in that community, there they have a bank of mailboxes. So the very, mail yeah, carrier very, just pulls up there, like you would see at a uh, condo or an mm-hmm. apartment complex. And this is what about a mile from their house? Yeah, that's yeah. where Keith goes looking for Sherry uh, when he's tracking the phone. Again, I don't put a ton of weight into people saying, "Hey, I never saw her run," because. She wasn't a runner. She was newly, or what Keith says is she's getting back into running. And when he says she's getting back into running, it could have been something she did 15 years ago, right? So she was getting back into running to run with her family. Um, She did live there for quite some time, though. Again, though, like... Uh, it could have been something that she did in high school or, or no, no, no. I, I get what you're saying. I just want to be clear and point out that these, the neighbors who regarding their statements, they were neighbors of hers for years. It wasn't like, right. Which I understand that, but I'm also stating that there's a bunch of people in her family, not saying that she was an avid runner saying this is a, this is a new thing. You, you know what I mean? Like she was training for this, this one event mm-hmm. with her family. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm not suspicious of the running itself. I'm suspicious of the wording that keeps circling around <laughs> that. So the normal thing. Sergeant Brian Jackson said to People Magazine in October 2017, quote, what was the purpose? He's talking about the abduction. Why was she released? It is hard to keep somebody in captivity for 22 days. Why would somebody go to that length? Those are all types of questions we still have. Yeah. The the other thing, too, is a lot of people say that this is real because of something as simple as the broken nose. Mm-hmm. And my argument would be if you're a wackadoo enough to plan out um, going missing, that you're also wackadoo enough to break your own nose. That That would be my argument to those people. The other thing too, is people I've been hearing a lot of people say, well, if, if this was for attention that she hasn't really shared the spotlight, she she hasn't really received any attention because she's been in hiding pretty much. Right. She's basically, I I shouldn't say hiding, but she's, well, she's, she's basically become a recluse. They've moved. Uh, they don't live in that town anymore. So they move away and and neighbors are like, yeah, we never see her. Mm -hmm. We don't see her at all. And so, so that doesn't make a lot of sense, the attention part. But then when people say money, they go, oh, well, uh, she did this for money or, or it couldn't be a fake because she didn't get money. Well, we know that we have about $50,000, which isn't a ton of money, but it's money that's not accounted for. And, and so. But then people go, well, but that's just a little bit of money. Think about how much money she could make if she wrote a book. And my argument about any of this stuff is maybe all this stuff is coming. Maybe a book is coming. Maybe a movie is coming. So you can't rule that that out as a possibility that money wasn't a motivation to fake this. Well, okay. We'll we'll get into this now because, uh, look, you look as far as the money goes. Let's keep in mind 
fifty thousand dollars, according to what I could find, was was equal to or very close to being equal to their yearly household income. Yeah. That that fifty thousand dollars sounds a lot bigger when you describe it that way, right? It takes somebody a whole year. It, the the whole family together, the whole household income is equal to this for a, the entirety of a year. So that seems like quite a bit more money when well, you describe right. it that way. And, and if somebody recently just lost their part-time position and now is a stay-at-home mom, maybe you need that money. Well, and then people that point out, hey, this is real because she had a broken nose. Right. I, I hate to answer... Uh, you know, answer a question with a question, but who's saying that she has a broken nose or that she had a broken nose? Right. Keith. So if Keith is in on it, or let's say he's not, let's say something went down and he doesn't know what's going on, but she has convinced him that something went down. He's either standing up for her or could be covering for her. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's where I I think you're going to get these arguments back and forth. I do want to get into something, you know, I said we'd get back to that press release. Well, one more thing. I also want to say that, you know, during the press press release or the cops have said multiple times, you're held in captive for 22 days. What was the motivation for them to release her? And like you stated before, there was multiple statements saying that we'd give you this money if they were released. And then it became the day before she was released. There was another statement. Issue. There's a threat. Right. There's so the a, captors, not a, not just a threat, but it's like, again, maybe there was some contact and maybe that's the reason why we don't know where this GoFundMe money went because it actually went to paying these people off to get her out. Could be. Could be, but but the threat that was going out there the day before she was released was not that this money is going to be given to you to to right, pay right. a ransom for her safe return. We're going to use this money to find you. Right, but I'm just saying that all of that could have changed if the people actually tried to make contact and say, hey, yeah, we got her and we want the money. So in October of 2017, this is when the authorities finally released two sketches of the women described by Sherry. The release noted that the sketches were being released 10 months after Sherry's disappearance because of Sherry's difficulty in recalling what her abductors look like. Now, this part, Captain, I believe is is quite important as well. The FBI poster states, quote, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, in cooperation with the Shasta County Sheriff's Office, is asking for the public's assistance regarding the disappearance of of Sherry Papini, end quote. This poster was released well after Sherry was returned alive. I question why the poster would use the word, why they wouldn't use the word abduction instead of the word disappearance. Right. Also, the poster says FBI is seeking information about the two, quote, individuals depicted in the sketches. They may have information. The poster does not call the women suspects or perpetrators or even persons of interest. And according to Sherry, she has told law enforcement, these are the people that abducted me at gunpoint. Yeah. Strange. Also about a year later, authorities released surveillance footage from a church in Woodland, California. This is near where Sherry turned up. This appears to show a distorted image of a figure running through a parking lot in the dark and then running back, law enforcement confirmed that the footage, timestamped 4.15 a.m., shows a newly released Sherry Papini seemingly darting around looking for help just before running onto the highway entrance ramp. Many people believe that police released this video as well as much of the other official information, meaning the male DNA found on Sherry, the right. Michigan man story, the stated inconsistencies about the cut on her foot to make Sherry feel pressure and that maybe she would crack. And and if, if there was a different story, if there was a different truth to what went down, that she would come forward and give them that information. Yeah. I wonder if it's the idea that 
law enforcement and say, not only do we have this footage, but we have even more footage that we're, we're not even going to show the public. And we're going to let you know that we have it because maybe they, maybe there's some footage uh, uh, of her earlier than that. Who knows? And I do want to make sure that we go through some more detailed theories here about what could have happened. I'm, I am going to skip ahead a bit. Uh, one of the theories was that this is a sex trafficking case. I do want to, if anybody wants to explore that angle, you can. But I, I will just kind of sum that up with saying that the police say that they have ruled out sex trafficking as a motive for Sherry's abduction. Well, and based off what Keith says, there was no sexual assault. Yeah, and the thing here is I think that there are some more plausible, some more likely theories in this situation if, in fact, it was a hoax, if this is not truly an abduction. One of those theories is a liaison gone very wrong. This theory probably stems from the revelation that Sherry was in contact with the Michigan man. Some people believe that police revealed this information to show that Sherry was conducting an affair or maybe affairs with men outside of her marriage. The theory goes like this, that she texted Keith to find out whether he'd be coming home for lunch, this to ensure that he was busy. The kids are gone all day. And she was meeting up with a lover or meeting up with an intended love lover. And either one of two things happened. One, it went wrong and the guy turned out to be violent and dangerous. And she escaped this man 22 days later, but was too embarrassed to tell the truth. Right. The other angle of this is that she bailed on her husband and kids to run off with a guy or this guy and then fake the whole abduction thing so that she could return, but return to her family blame free people who buy into this theory. Well, they, they basically claim captain that the sheriff's office knows they know that Sherry made the whole thing up. They just can't prove it. Right now. I do want to be clear here. We do not have any insider information, but from what I can see, the general rumor of people in that area, it seems like they believe that the sheriff's office is pretty much split as to whether this is a hoax or if this was an actual abduction. And the rumors that I have seen from that area point to that the two lead investigators, well, I, I should be clear about this. Because it sounds like the first lead investigator on this believes that it's a hoax. But we know that we have we have the head sheriff in charge, and we also have Sergeant Jackson, who have very publicly stated that they believe this is a real abduction. The rumors I've seen is that those are the only two that believe within the sheriff's office that this abduction was real. Yeah. So you can see why it's easy to really question this and really be suspicious of the whole thing. Um, one other theory that I saw, Captain, is that this could be a drug situation. Now, I chose to leave this in because I find it much more likely than some of the other theories that are out there. But I want to be clear, this should be taken with a grain of salt, okay? <laughs> Because this was this was pulled off of Reddit. It does come from someone who's been granted verified insider status as somebody being an insider on this case. The post states that Sherry had a serious addiction to benzodiazepine and that Keith was using some other type of drugs and she was using other types of drugs as well. This insider, using air quotes there, says that Sherry relapsed a few times and had resorted to buying pills on the street. Now, this insider theorizes that Sherry had gone on a bender or someone she owed drug money to had abducted her. Again, this would point to a similar theory to that of the hoax to gain the GoFundMe money, the GoFundMe funds. While I think that this is, is more likely than some of the other theories that are out there, I want I want to be clear. I think it's one of the least likely theories that we've discussed here today. 
I've purposely left out theories that seem just totally off the wall, totally unlikely at all. Bigfoot. Yeah. Yeah. Sasquatch. So the thing here, Captain, we have, we've talked about revenge. We've talked about an affair. We've talked about drugs, um, all kinds of different reasons, different theories as to why this would be a faked abduction. Uh, you've pointed out some reasons why it would be a real abduction. Mm-hmm. We we would be remiss if we didn't bring up a, a story from 2015. This was the kidnapping of Denise Huskins in Vallejo, California. Denise and her boyfriend Aaron were asleep one night when a man broke into their home and made her tie up Aaron and kidnapped Denise. He raped and assaulted her, but eventually released her, dropping her off from his car on the side of the road. Detectives at the time assumed the couple's brutal abduction story was a complete hoax, but eventually the perpetrator, a Harvard-trained attorney named Matthew Muller, was caught after committing another crime, a, a similar crime. Right. The, the Vallejo Police Department settled with Denise Huskins for $2.5 million. So this is just another situation of where they come out and this situation, they were very public about it being a hoax. They didn't believe yeah. the story. Where we well, see the because- Shasta County Sheriff's Office, they seem to be confused or or not quite clear on what their actual stance is right yeah but that's because there was a rape involved and and i mean let's just be honest as far as uh sexual assaults in this country it's maybe the only crime that i can think of that law enforcement after you um after you make your statement and after you claim that there was a crime that they go, are you telling the truth? I mean, it's like the only crime that that happens for. I mean, you don't go, Hey, my bike was stolen from my garage and have police come out and go, you know, within the first couple minutes, ask you if you're lying about it. So that, that I think that just happens far too often with that type of well it appears and it appears that that's happening with abduction stories as well right because that's what we're reporting on today and it makes it a lot easier to know that the police were just straight up wrong in the denise huskins case because they do apprehend the perpetrator you know where you have questions about sherry's story and about her abduction but if tomorrow they arrested two hispanic looking women that they could prove abducted her. Right. I mean, that wipes everything completely away. All right. Yeah. Um, it's, it really is a, a difficult thing. It doesn't seem to be that there's any clear answer. I don't know if you have an opinion on what you think may have happened here, captain. Uh, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to ramble too long, but all I could come up with conclusion wise, because we normally go, what do you think? is uh, the word that comes to mind is sad is if this is real and oh, it's a horrible situation. If the, this is real, and can you imagine that it's horrible? It's 22 days of torture. You, you got a branding on your body, possibly forever, you know, cutting your hair, breaking your nose. I, you know, it's just, that's awful. If it's a hoax and she was going to go, hang out with some guy and that went wrong or it went well or whatever it was that that's sad too. the fact that she was talking to multiple men behind her husband. That's sad. You know, if it was a drug thing, that's sad that she would go missing from her kids for 22 days because of drugs. That's sad. The fact that she is now a recluse, at least we have some proof of that or at least that's what some neighbor neighbors claim. And that's what her husband claims. That's sad. Um, it's almost like any theory that you come up with that you think happened. It's sad. If it, if it was just for seeking attention, that is sad. That is somebody that has serious mental issues, um, that needs help. And 
is probably not getting it uh, because of this whole ordeal and now being um, a recluse. Um, But my gut doesn't tell me either way because, like you said, the most difficult thing about this whole case is where the information is coming from. I don't know what this, this branding is. I don't know if there's some message involved. I, there's there's different things that point me to believe one thing over another thing. But again, it's where the information is coming from. And I don't believe the sources. Yeah, I, I tell you what, I'm going to give Sherry the benefit of the doubt here and say that I believe her story. I believe that she was abducted and... I hope they continue. I hope police continue to search for her abductors and whoever, whoever, you know, carried out these terrible crimes. Right. The only reason why I lean that way, I am suspicious of some things, but, but here, here's the problem. I'm not suspicious of a lot of the things that I see people being suspicious of online. And then the, the fact that she was released that seemed to even bolster people's suspicions. Like, oh, she she turned up. Nobody right. ever lets people go. All right, th- that doesn't happen a lot. We do know that, but we do we already pointed to at least one other case where that did in fact take place. The captor released them. Anytime somebody is missing, if they were abducted, that is what we hope and pray for each and every minute of every hour of every day that they are gone, that whoever has them will grow a heart and release them. Mm -hmm. And if in fact that happened in this situation, whether it be that the abductors got scared, felt threatened, got tired of holding her, whatever happened that caused them to release her, I'm thankful that they did. So I kind of lean toward this story being, being truthful, Sherry's story being truthful. And what I want to point out is the, the radio call that went out to the ambulance that states that, there was an assault that she was badly beaten. Mm. That to me is the one that's the only other part where I can see somebody other than her husband stating that these injuries actually took place or that she appeared to have been injured. Now, if, if in fact this was a hoax, if, if she wasn't really abducted, if this was carried out, we know that somebody else had to be involved because she was missing for 22 days. She disappeared for 22 days. Somebody had to help her with that. If there was anybody involved in a hoax, I I have no reason to believe, I actually believe that Keith does not know right. what really happened. I, I don't, I don't see, I understand these theories and I understand the speculation but I don't see anything that points to me that, that he was involved in helping carry out this whole ordeal. In November of 2018, Sergeant Jackson told the local ABC 10 TV station that he did not consider Sherry's case cold and that there's still several avenues we are looking at. But now nearly three years after Sherry Papini's perplexing disappearance and reappearance, and what has been described as, quote, one of the largest manhunts in California history, we still have no answers. We've never heard from Sherry. Her family has gone silent. Secret Witness of California is still offering $10,000 for information regarding the abduction of Sherry Papini. Today's show is sponsored by Simply Safe. Simply Safe makes home security easy with no contract, hidden fees, or fine print. For just $15 a month, you get 24 7 professional monitoring throughout your home. And Simply Safe uses their revolutionary video verification technology to visually confirm that break ins are happening, allowing police to get to you 3.5 times faster. Visit simplysafe.com slash garage. And you'll get free shipping and a 60-day risk-free trial. That's simplysafe.com slash garage. 
simplysafe.com slash garage read as much as you want from over 1 million books on kindle switch between reading and listening with over 5,000 audiobooks or choose from a rotating selection of popular magazines books may be added and removed from time to time but you can read titles like 1984 a killer's mind river in darkness and the handmaid's tale for a limited time Get three months of Kindle Unlimited for one ninety nine by visiting Amazon.com slash TCG. Make sure you type that in all lowercase. That's Amazon.com slash TCG. And as always, thank you. Thank all of you out there for listening. Thank you for telling a friend. Thank you for the wonderful five-star reviews on iTunes. Please join us back here in the garage next week. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter.